Corsica, the focus of attention each November for motorsport followers as the world's top rally drivers tackle the daunting Tour de Corse. <laughs> This year, the event attracted even more attention than usual, with Fiat poised to take the world championship for makes, providing they could secure a good result. With typically Italian enthusiasm, Fiat's team had taken on the proportions of a small army, with no less than four work cars, four work supported entries, and a reported 500 service mechanics. Lancia were there in strength, led by the brilliant, if unpredictable, Sandro Minardi, making the Italian presence so heavy, it was hard to find Ford, who were Fiat's main rivals for the championship. But two escorts had been entered, one to be driven by a slightly overawed Russell Brooks. They've spent a fortune. Their uh, motorsport budget for the three arms of Fiat, like that's Ferrari, Lancia, Fiat, is reputed to be in the region of three and a half million. And when you see the, the number of training cars they bring and the number of personnel that they bring, you can believe it, yes. They really do tackle it in a big way. It's a bit of a David and Goliath act, actually, between Ford and Fiat and here. Leyland had two TR7s, one for Brian Culcheth, whose recent Max Rally plays surely boded well. I think the uh, opposition here is slightly stronger than in the Manx, although, you know, there was some... Obviously, most of the works teams were at the Manx, but um, you haven't got the, the world championship contenders that you've obviously got here. Um, I think that we will come through with a good result. One o'clock Saturday, Munari led 136 starters away on the first stage. Ahead lay 1,350 kilometres of tight, twisting tarmac roads to be completed in just 24 hours. Munari was backed by Pinto in Stratos number four. Carello in number 19, and a fourth Stratos. The Italian presence on the road was almost bemusing. The string of Fiat's seemed endless, but Kelly in car number three. French star Bernard Darniche, car number five. Another French driver, Andre, in car number seven. The very quick Italian, Verini, car number nine. Vincent, car 16. It was an impressive display from Fiat, making the Ford presence seem innocuous and scarcely worthy of consideration. But Jean-Pierre Nicolas in escort number two and Russell Brooks wanted to prove that David could still surprise Goliath, although the British driver was finding it hard to grasp the magnitude of the task. It's incredibly twisty, incredibly narrow little tarmac roads up and down mountain passes. We checked our pace notes for the Manx Trophy Rally, for instance, and we have seven corners per kilometre. I believe that the San Remo Rally had 14 per kilometre, and this one has 25 corners per kilometre. And what was Brian Culture's view of the event from the wheel of his TR7? Here is a hell of a lot of very tight corners, which makes very hard work physically, the amount of G on one's body flying about between these little tight corners is very exhausting. I doubt if we'll get into fourth gear, let alone fifth, more than a handful of times um, on each of the stages. By Saturday afternoon, Minari was out. The lead fell inevitably to a Fiat, the Frenchman Andre, twice winner of the Tour de Course. Pinto held a tenuous second in the Stratos, but by evening, Andre was out, and the lead taken by yet another Fiat, this time Bernard Darliche. Behind him, a gaggle of Fiat's almost blanketed the top dozen places. domination seemed absolute except for one car, Jean-Pierre Nicolas in the escort. This Anglo-French alliance was proving outstandingly successful. With Brooks out of the rally through a broken back axle, it fell to the brilliant Frenchman to take on the might of Fiat, a task he relished as he flew into second place to challenge seriously for the lead.
After an encouraging start to the event, Colchester and the TR7 had slowed with a puzzling mechanical problem. But he battled on gamely, the only all-British team remaining in the event. As the cars drove into the only rest halt in the rally at 1am Sunday, Darnish's lead was confirmed with a further four Fiat's in the top ten. The Kelly, Vincent, the all-girl crew of Michel Mouton and Conconi, and the Italian Verini. Jean-Pierre Nicola, however, in the lone escort, had dropped a place to third. Um, it was going very well before a slow puncture in, uh, in the long special stage. And then uh, I have done uh, about 10 kilometers with a flat wheel in the front. And um, when I stop at the service, uh, I, we change the wheel. And I have lost about uh, four minutes. Brian, what exactly are the problems you've been having? Well, we've, we've had a, a very badly slipping clutch and we had to do the longest and most important stage of the rally at 40 miles an hour and we were only just able to get up the hills. Have you managed to do anything about it service-wise or not? Um, no, we have um, stopped the oil leak onto it and it's now improving and uh, we just hope it will burn the oil off and uh, hope we can catch up some of the time. So we'd go like hell trying anyway. <laughs> but it was going to be a hard fight for the TR7 driver who was well down the field as the car set off on the night stages at three in the morning. Ahead lay six time special stages of 100 kilometers and more apiece. At 7am Sunday, Danish was still ahead driving with impeccable coolness on the slippery morning stages. <laughs> Behind him holding second, Pinto Stratos. And third with a Stratos firmly in his sights, Jean-Pierre Nicolas, fast making up the time he'd lost. It was a Stratos sandwich for the Ford driver with Carello coming up behind in fourth place. The fields of Bichelli, Mouton, Vincent and Verini were still there in the top ten. Back in contention, Colchester was beginning to get the TR7 on the move again, working his way rapidly up the field. For some, those slippery early Sunday morning stages nearly spelt disaster. But the weather was fine with the promise of another hot day for the final leg of the event. And that leg held more than a hint of excitement and interest. Could Nicola in the Ford stay in contention and prevent Fiat from clinching the World Championship? Could the lone British driver culture force the TR7 back up the field to challenge some of the Fiats? It all hung in the balance. Throughout Sunday, Culture's fine drive continued as he worked up from 21st to finish a fine 11th overall. Ahead of him, the battle raged on. 
Almeros in Porsche 18 completed a fine rally, six overall. Four minutes ahead, Vincent in Fiat 16 took fifth. Yet another Fiat, Bacchelli, forced his way into third overall, just one minute ahead of Corello in the Stratos. But where was Nicola in the escort? Pinto Stratos came through to second overall after the news that the gallant Frenchman had finally succumbed to transmission failure when in sight of the leader. It was a sad end to a remarkable effort by the diminutive Ford team. It left Fiat as outright winners of this 21st Tour de Course. Darnish in the number five car coolly completed the last stage with nearly four minutes in hand to give him an impressive third victory in Corsica and put Fiat in an unassailable position in the World Championship. Amidst the expected scenes of jubilation at the finish, Leyland's Brian Culcheth, the only British finisher after 100 cars had failed to make the line, summed up his rally in the TR7. This is the first time we've been on such a competitive world championship event in Europe and um, you know it's one of the toughest road rallies there is so I think we've certainly learned something apart from the clutch trouble we've had absolutely nothing else wrong with the car the rest of the cars run perfect <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.